Since 2008, LinkedIn eclipsed 1 billion monthly active users. That's a massive power. And you hit the nail on the head, John, when you said it is the place to do business. If you look at LinkedIn today and you look back at it 15 years ago, it's still the same place. It's a pure business to business environment. So for business owners and business practitioners to engage with one another, for job seeking and recruiting, it's the place to do that. The reason LinkedIn has been a priority for our company is we learned early on that it was just a great place to engage potential buyers of our product. And so dating back to 2013, I always had an internal team at my company and, and at my various companies today that focuses on LinkedIn for lead generation. This is the Entrepreneurs United podcast with your hosts, John St. Pierre and Rich Hoffman. We're here today with Charles Grenther, who is somewhat a serial entrepreneur, has multiple businesses, and one on the leading edge that he's working within is purchasing e-companies, purchasing technology companies. And I'd love to know right off the bat, Charles, what have you noticed in your almost six years of working and looking at getting technology companies acquired, what have you noticed? What's changed, particularly over COVID? And you've had six years in this space. Rich, John, thanks for having me on today's episode. The, the number one thing that has evolved in the last handful of years with respect to COVID and the changing in the dynamics of the workplace is when I look at a company to evaluate for acquisition or even partnership, oftentimes the conversation about staff and where they are and how they function and operate is a totally different conversation today than it was four years ago. Because 90% of the companies have uh, at least significant chunks of their operating organization working remote and oftentimes distributed globally. And so that brings in a, a new host of challenges when you're looking to evaluate a company. It used to be Oh, they have a headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan. Great. We'll fly out to Detroit and we'll do our due diligence on site. That's not possible anymore with most of the companies that we are evaluating. So Charles, what, when you say that, what I just heard in the two buzzwords was remote distributed. If we took that a step further, how much more are you seeing of actual full-time employees, what we used to call FTEs? versus independent contractors that can scale up and down with your growth, because that seems to be a monumental shift as well. Yes. So yeah, FTE is a uh, full-time equivalent. So the term still remains, but oftentimes that those 40 hour allotments are sometimes multiple positions, multiple independent contractors. It seems to me that the further a company gets outside of its core product delivering, when you're talking about HR, legal, looking at oftentimes development, engineering, these resources are now almost always outsourced or independent contractors. A lot of times sales teams, customer support, that still tends to be, depending on the company's roadmap, oftentimes I'm still finding that those are full-time employee, W4 employee, W2 employees versus independent contractor. So I'm curious, what is your opinion on that? Let's get real for a second. We used to have these businesses with the ping pong tables and the dartboards oh. and the foosball and, the, and like this corporate environment where you're building a company. I had all of those things. I had all of those things in my office. Yeah. And now you got none of it. Now you're looking at the screen, talking to us on Zoom, trying to figure out if we're doing what we should be doing. Meanwhile, I have three other jobs and maybe I'm giving a little bit of attention to your thing. Is this sustainable long-term, you think, to grow businesses? Yeah. If you had asked me that question four years ago, when I think it was St. Patrick's Day of, of, of 2020, when I just, just sent my entire staff home that was in my 40 person office about four miles from my home, I would say, absolutely not. This is temporary. We're going to be back in our office by Mother's Day, right? That was the thinking at the time. Now I'm very fortunate because I have a, a decent sized home. I had a room that I could turn into a, a real functioning office. And now I can't even imagine really going back to the office environment. And I was a guy who loved the camaraderie, the coalescing of the teens and culture in person. I loved it. I thrived in that environment. 
But what I found is through my own personal discipline, I've been able to propagate that same enthusiasm, ability to build culture, ability to connect teams uh, on a remote basis. I think I might be in the minority. I, I, I never miss my morning standups. I have a routine where I, I hit the track running very first thing in the morning. I get into my office. I lock my door. My family knows really not to disturb me only in case of emergency. It's as if I was commuting to my office. And because I run my life with that discipline, it's basically the same for me. I know it's not the same for everybody else. So your company is Relentless Venture Studios. Can you give us a example or give us a feel for the size and scope of Relentless? Yeah, absolutely. And it's an interesting story because we were very much affected during the sort of pandemic era, if you will. 2018, my, the, our founder, Alex Minicucci, a, a partner of mine, um, previous to Relentless, uh, launched the, the Venture Studio with an initial uh, cohort of investments. And so at the time, 2018, we launched with really uh, two companies in our portfolio. Within about two years' time, there's some acquisitions, there's some investments. That's when I get come, come in and join the team. And going into the pre-vaccine pandemic, we had five companies in our portfolio. During that initial year and a half of what are we going to do? When will the vaccine be widely distributed? When will we get back to normal? We had an, just an unprecedented inflow of companies coming our way that were in distress because they were not as well footed in, in terms of dealing with the, the lockdowns and the changes in the business landscape. And so during that 18 to 24 month period, we acquired 11 additional companies. And so our portfolio quadrupled, tripled in size during that period of time. And right now there's roughly 16, soon to be 18 companies within our portfolio, some of which are where we have a minority position where we've invested in founders. And then some of our companies are internal spin-ups because as a venture studio, we have great resources in every major business discipline. And so I have economies of scale where I can use different divisions within my company to function within multiple companies at once. And so the scope of our portfolio is now 16, soon to be 18 companies, largely software, almost all have a, a, a relationship to technology in some capacity or another. Thank you. And how many exits have you had up to this point? So we've had two. Truth be told, we thought our exit horizon would have, we would have been out of most of those early positions, but the pandemic certainly did push some of the goalposts back on us. And we had technology that focused on the automotive industry, technology that focused on hospitality, restaurants, and all of those industries were turned upside down during the pandemic. So there were a handful of pivots in there. And right now we are in a number of LOIs to exit some additional positions, but we're in the fortunate position where we don't have to take the first deal that comes along. So we're pretty judicious about how we exit our preference is not is to exit where it's a where companies are acquired by a strategic partner, and so that we can take a proverbial second bite of the apple. So oftentimes we like to exit a position, retain some equity, so that new organization grows that business segment up, and then we have another opportunity to exit. And of the sixteen companies, all of those you have a minority position and none of them are simply and from an advisory or consulting standpoint. Is that correct? Th that is correct. We own at minimum a uh, minority position. I think our smallest position is 20% ownership. And then there are companies within the portfolio where we own 100% and, and have no outside investors. Got it. And so you will either buy or build companies. And when you build the companies, you'll partner with an existing CEO, presumably to help build for an exit. What is the most common advice you find yourself giving CEOs in growth phases to prepare them for an exit, even though an ex exit is not eminent? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And actually, one of our companies, Maverick, focuses on this, and that is to 
function within your business as if you're exiting next month. And that is to say, to have all of your fiduciary documentation, all of your internal SOPs articulated, well-documented to, to try to dispel the tribal knowledge concept into a you know, physical form so that when you do make an exit, there's a transition that is smooth and seamless. And so our company, Maverick, um, focuses on business owners having a software partner that is agile in facilitating that through this formula and system we've built for readying your company for exit. So if a founder is interested in exiting, whether it be in six months or six years, they should be running their company today as if someone's ready to come take a look at the books tomorrow to get rid of idiosyncratic things that only make sense to that particular individual or those individual teams and to make it universally understood and acceptable. So just as a, for instance, on the accounting side, you want to make sure you're using gap principles across all of your revenue recognition. Oftentimes we'll look at a company and we'll say, this revenue doesn't make sense. Well, that's a prepaid contract. Oh, guess what? 99 out of a hundred times, you cannot book the revenue the way you're booking it. In fact, you're like, you're committing financial fraud to be frank. So those are some of the simple, basic things you find at a first pass, but then oftentimes things like employee handbooks or the difference between how uh, full-time employees, W2 employees versus independent contractors are handled. That oftentimes is, that's a big issue for a lot of companies, actually, to be honest, on the independent contractor side. I want to go there, but before I follow up on that last part, you said you have a software partner that helps ready for exit. Tell me more about what does that software partner do exactly? Yeah. So Navrit Technologies used to be under a different title, DealMaker Pro. It is a software interface similar to what you might experience with a QuickBooks technology where it was created by M&A professionals with 30 plus years of experience in as business brokers, helping founders exit business through that transium. And they took their formulas for what makes for the proper documentation during that process. And we at Relentless partnered with them to turn it into a software experience for the business owner. And so what it allows the business owner to do is invite the buyers during due diligence to their account, have their own unique logins, and then they are able to experience the business in all the different states of needed readiness for the exit. And oftentimes this process is a, a SharePoint room, some type of Dropbox where just a bunch of files are thrown in there and go figure it out. Our software actually facilitates the parts of the due diligence necessary in, in, in 99 out of 100 deals for business exits. And, and our focus with this software is the 50 to 100 million market in terms of exit value. Got it. And your recommendation is that a company who wants to exit between 50 and 100 million partner with or use Maverick Technologies along the way, even though there's not an eminent sale, always have it ready to sell yes. in the next month. And Maverick is the company that will help them to be in that position. So when it is time to sell, it is relatively seamless. Yeah, because what what will happen is you'll find as a business owner, let's just say you're looking to sell your business. So you hop on a website like a biz buy sell or flip on, you start to build your profile. You're going to find that those sites are going to ask for a number of different pieces of data points, even though it's very high level, it's 10 minutes into it, you'll see it's pretty formidable. Yeah. We want to take a look at the last three years P and L's. Do, do you even have that in order? It's, it's remarkable how often companies don't have it. Oh yeah, we, we didn't do 2022 because COVID or whatever. But 23 is in order and 21 looks solid, but 22 is missing. Oh, really? Or you get into the ta taxes. So often we'll find that companies that look just fantastic on the website and scaling and tremendous customer growth. And then you ask about our taxes up to date and then you find, oh, Actually, we've been working with our CPA and this happened and that happened and this story and that story. And you know what winds up happening is no formidable buyer is ever going to buy a company that has two years of tax liabilities potentially hanging out there. So even though it didn't seem like a big deal to the owner at the time, you find that 
by the time you're looking to exit, you're in a situation where you have a mission critical elements of your business that you're not going to be able to just have ready tomorrow that your buyer needs to see in order to facilitate the clothes. So Charles, I have a question on this. This is a technology I think I need. I just did a quick search, Maverick Technologies. It didn't, I don't think the company that you said came up, what, what is the name or the domain of the company if people want to learn more about it? Yeah, it's Maverick. The way I'm looking at it is you're looking for that. What happens in a business is you go form your business and you get some formation papers from your state and then you file for an EIN with the, just on the startup phase. And then all of a sudden, five years later, it's, where's your documentation? And you're like, oh, it's in some folder somewhere in Google Docs or Google Drive and things get lost. And I have a business where we're registered in all 50 states, state registration, sales tax filings. We got all these things. And over time, the documents get lost. And to have a library like this is really interesting. So yeah. I see it's M-A-V-R-E-K.com, Maverick, M-A-V. R-E-K.com, the software for selling or buying a business just got easier. Love it. Yeah. And the truth is it's a fairly simple interface. The real, the secret sauce with Maverick is that it, it was built by um, a family office, business brokers who'd been involved in scores of exits and transactions. And so they took what they'd learned over 30 years of buying and selling businesses and they articulated that to Relentless, our team, and we built the software. Love that, it. Okay. Thanks for sharing. I'll check that up because that's something I think I love the idea of always have your crap together. Just always yeah. have your things tight because you just never know. And I was in a situation, Charles, a few years ago where we decided on a whim, you know what, maybe now's the time to sell our business. We went through a whole process and it was like, oh my gosh, now's not the right time to sell our business. We weren't prepared. We weren't prepared to be in that position. So I love that feedback and I appreciate you sharing that information. A lot of founders also are now, maybe a bit less so now than say four or five years ago, but fundraising has become democratized now with crowdfunding. And so even if a company decides to do a modest half a million, million dollar raise, the steps that one has to take in order to cross all of the legal hurdles required to do something as innocuous as, as raise a half a million dollars, it's formidable. So if your company is in order, it's very easy to do that. If you're missing financials, if you don't have your SOPs properly articulated, then most shrewd investors will pass on your opportunity, no matter how great it might be. So I think you generally want to run your business almost to where it's the public standards. And when I say that, I'm talking about companies that are publicly traded have to yep. have quarterly filings in order. They have to have annual reports. They have to have clear and concise communication to shareholders. And so you may not have any shareholders right now, but if your business is ready to have itself be an open book, then you're going to be attractive to the most shrewd investors, partners, and, and the like. What about companies who are looking to exit between less than 50 and 100 million, if they're even looking to exit between one and 10? Do you target 50 to 100 because of the expense point of the product? Or do you tell no. because there, there's not value for a company between one and 10? Or, or what do you have for somebody? Well, then? I actually said five to 100 million. At, truth be told, if someone has a dry cleaning business that they would, might exit for a million dollars, Maverick would still be worth being part of because it will offer you the roadmap to exit success, if hmm. you will. Um, and entrepreneurs can join for free and can have access to the platform and access to the team over there at Maverick. And then uh, there are a number of business add-ons that one could take advantage of once they become a member of the Maverick community and that's their business model. So I do want to follow up on that statement you made regarding employees versus independent contractors. What have you noticed there as far as advice you might give companies who have both potentially? So first of all, the rules and laws that govern employee status versus independent contractor status vary from state to state. So that's a, a very important distinction, at least here in the US. Um, overseas, the rules are fairly uniform or they don't exist at all. So in a, a business owner looking to expand may have a remote team. 
needs to be mindful of where they're doing business, where their employees or independent contractors are domiciled, um, because that becomes an important distinction in what you can and can't do. Independent contractors, as a rule of thumb, have to be able to determine to large degree their own hours and their own processes. Now that you can basically divulge during the screening and interview process that in order to be an independent contractor of my company or our company or this company, you need to follow these rules. And then it's up to the independent contractor to decide whether or not they want to be part of that with, let's say you have very stringent rules. It is, it is illegal in many states to treat independent contractors like employees, which is to say, let's say you have an 8 a.m. standup every morning. And you require employees and independent contractors to show up at that 8 a.m. standup. You are violating independent contractor laws, certainly where I am in California, by, by requiring that. You can also not purchase software business related materials for independent contractors. If you do, they have to be classified as employees which means they have to have mandated health insurance. I'm just talking of California, which means they have to be eligible for all overtime rules, which is fine and well, but that's the state of California. If you're working with an offshore independent contractor team based in the Philippines, the, those rules just, they don't apply. Yeah, it is vital. I think it's very important to have for both employees and independent contractors, a mutually executed engagement agreement that clearly articulates what the company's expectations are of that either employee or independent contractor and be very wary as a business owner of picking up the tab, paying for any business related work related expenses for independent contractors, because it is just not allowed in most states unless they are employees. So you've got Maverick on the exit side of a business life cycle. What company do you have on the lead gen or the more startup side? Yeah. So our portfolio includes a company that is in, involved in franchise marketing. That's a, a specialty, something we have expertise in. And so we have a franchise marketing company, but one that's a bit more universal is we have made a real internal habit of using LinkedIn for lead generation. A lot of companies do a ton of social media, content generation and ad buying. We have focused a lot of our energies over the many years of our experience on LinkedIn lead generation. And so we've got a company called CastNet uh, with proprietary software that we've built and continue to refine that helps 10X a, a person's ability to build their network and engage their network on LinkedIn. And then beyond that, we also have a relatively new company called Linked VA Now, where our team actually acts in many respects as agency for our clients and actually will run the LinkedIn profiles for our clients and turn them into the, as we like to say, the lead generation gold mine they should be. So Charlie, I just want to make sure I caught that. Castnet. It's cast a net. The, the website is gocastanet.com. And that is for a software only version of this system that I've described. And then linked VA now is our full service agency like model where it's a premium service for individual LinkedIn account holders who are looking to build their network, engage their network and turn their LinkedIn profiles into lead generation operations. Okay. Just to make sure again, that we're getting the right domains here. I went to cast a net.com. So C A S T a net.com. That's the automated B2B lead generation for entrepreneurs. And then the other domain is what? Link to VA now.com. Like link L I N K V mm -hmm. is in Victor A is an apple yeah. N O W.com. Okay. Perfect. Thanks for sharing that because I want to make sure that we have people can go find more information. So why LinkedIn? I look at LinkedIn, Charles, and I say, look, if I was in fashion, maybe I'd be on Instagram. If I was doing funny things, maybe I'd be on TikTok. But as an entrepreneur, I do go to LinkedIn quite a bit. That's like the professional social media. Is that the reason why LinkedIn versus other social platforms for you guys? 
Yeah. My personal use of LinkedIn as a business tool dates back to 2008, the very nascent early stages of LinkedIn. And, and I was relocating from the Los Angeles area where I lived in, and worked for many years to a, a nice uh, area up here in San Luis Obispo, 200 miles away. And so that was the moment I decided I should be on there. I'll let everyone know I'm leaving the market. I'm moving away and, and build my new network. Since 2008, you now have it this year, LinkedIn eclipsed 1 billion monthly active users. That's a massive power. And you hit the nail on the head, John, when you said it is the place to do business. If you look at LinkedIn today and you look back at it 15 years ago, it's still the same place. It's a pure business to business environment. So for business owners and business practitioners to engage with one another, for job seeking and recruiting, it's the place to do that. Most of the content on LinkedIn wouldn't look great on other social platforms and certainly vice versa. In fact, when users post a lot of on-business related materials, they'll either post it with a disclaimer that says, sorry for the personal post, blah, blah, blah. And then people who don't post the disclaimer often get shunned in the comments. Like, why are you putting this on here? This is for business. The reason LinkedIn has been a priority for our company is we learned early on, and this predates my relentless stint when I was working in software technology direct, that it was just a great place to engage potential buyers of our product. And so dating back to 2013, I always had an internal team at my company and, and at my various companies today that focuses on LinkedIn for lead generation. What I did last year is take that internal system of mine and turn it in, coalesce it into a product that has a monthly recurring subscription model where we can help business owners, entrepreneurs use their LinkedIn, harness their LinkedIn in a way they, they've never been able to. And we know this because Pew did a study last year, 98% of LinkedIn users are not really paying very much attention to their LinkedIn. It described one in 30 users as power users. That is to say daily active users, which one should be, but who has the time for that? So we've created this model where we have a software that you can use yourself. And we also have a full service, fully managed US-based team that will run your LinkedIn profile for you, build your network, engage your network. And then you as the business professional, sales professional largely can just focus on the outputs meetings on my calendar, virtual or in-person coffees, whatever your goal is as a business builder. Charles, we're, we're talking about mostly B2B, because if you're looking to promote hamburgers at your restaurant to consumers, that may be another platform. But we're talking about mostly B2B, I believe, correct? Yes. And are we talking about your company's LinkedIn profile and building your company's LinkedIn lead generation? Are we talking about individuals that are looking to sell to companies? That's a great question, John. It is individually owned profiles. Okay. These business profiles on LinkedIn cannot communicate the same way that individuals are able to communicate uh, with one another. And so for that reason, it must be the individual's uh, profile. And so when I look at our roster, we've had a banner July, we've had 30% growth just in the last month. The types of company, technology, marketing, medical device, franchise, food industry, cybersecurity, manufacturing, automotive, it's anybody in business that is doing B2B sales, this is the platform for you. If you're selling sunglasses to consumers, we can't really help. Gotcha. So for right, me, it is all about the individual. So it's typically BDRs, in some cases, VP level, vice president of sales, vice president of business development. Those are the types of profiles that we are typically working with. And we've got, we're approaching 250 accounts under management. So it's a pretty sizable concern, but because within my own internal organization, I've got my LinkedIn sales team managing 75 portfolio you know, accounts of our portfolio sales teams and principals, I was already built to do this. It's almost like the Amazon AWS model. Amazon needed all his giant server farms, uh, so they overbuilt it. And that's basically what I've done with my LinkedIn VA now support okay. team. 
So when I think about LinkedIn, I have my profile page, right? So you can go to my actual page and learn about me and where I went to school and where I worked and a little bit about what I'm trying to accomplish, right? I have content that I can create. I can publish articles. I can post clips of this podcast on there. I could do little content creation stuff out there to create kind of awareness and thought leadership. Uh, and then there's this, the, the messaging, I guess. You can target and send people messages. Those are the three ways I understand how to use LinkedIn from my perspective. I get emails all the time, people I don't know that are sending me messages to try and get on a call with them. I don't respond to any of them, quite honestly, because I, I get so many of them. What is the biggest myth you think of LinkedIn or the biggest misuse, uh, misconception of LinkedIn? And then on the opposite side of that, what would be the one thing you say, if you're going to do one thing, just do this? Mm, okay. Interesting questions. I think if we're talking about LinkedIn, the typical LinkedIn user is not active enough on their profile. So I would say it's a myth to think you can set up your LinkedIn profile, build a decent profile, decent picture, your CV is up to date, you've got your education, you've got your last handful of jobs, whatever it may be, and that you can set it and forget it. That's a myth. Nothing will happen. If you're not in your LinkedIn inbox on a regular basis where the communication is happening, then you are missing the boat on the whole purpose of building the business network on LinkedIn. So it's a myth to think you can build a good profile and something will happen. You have to actually go in and engage it. Content creation is obviously a great way to potentially attract individuals. But if you don't have a network, if you don't have a couple hundred followers, a couple thousand followers, no one's going to see your content. Yeah. So the way the algorithms work on LinkedIn is the relevance is based on the connections that are made. And so what we do very well is we build that network for you. We can also harness our software to engage your existing network in an aggregated fashion. And I want to be very clear, this isn't AI. We don't just have some kind of bot attached to your account that just does a lot of outreach and connecting. We actually have a team that will go in. And so the other thing is, it might be a myth on LinkedIn, is that connect with anybody and everybody. You can do that, but you're going to find a largely irrelevant business network you've built for yourself. If you're in the automotive space and you need to target used car sales managers to propagate your business growth, hit your goals, whatever it may be, then let's target those people. And so we can target your business network by title, by geography. And, and so a more strategic approach to growing your LinkedIn network is something that we actually advocate for and we do when we onboard new customers. So every new customer of our platform of Linked VA Now has an onboarding session where we dive pretty deep into what your ideal customer profiles are, what the, the markets you'd like to break into and crack, what your product roadmap looks like for the next couple of years, um, so that we can build the network for you to those specs. Um, if there's one thing I can say that uh, individuals on LinkedIn must do, uh, they should have a decent photo. <laughs> because so often, it's really wild, but People will take pictures of their driver's license photo or their, or it's a picture from a vacation from 10 years ago and it's grainy and blurry and uh, a grainy, blurry photo on LinkedIn certainly doesn't scream credibility. And uh, you're getting less likely to have your connection request accepted if you're trying to connect with someone you haven't met in, in real life. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Awesome. This was great. I certainly need to look into some of this myself, personally, both Maverick and <laughs> LinkedIn part. So I know that a lot of people, and certainly I, I want to encourage entrepreneurs that are listening to this, as your business grows and as time passes, a place to have all of your documents in one spot and always be prepared for exit is huge. And then from a business perspective, we spend a lot of time on social media, but being more targeted and having a really good plan of approach and using expertise like you can with GoCastNet or linkedvanow.com can really provide great return on investment. So uh, Charles, thanks a lot for your time today, and certainly we'll provide some links uh, for all of your sites in our in our in our notes here, so people can link and go straight to them. 
Any final thoughts from you to entrepreneurs listening to this episode? Yeah, I would say that it, it may seem daunting, just for example, on the LinkedIn side. Oh yeah, my LinkedIn profile is bad. I know it's bad. I need to do something. You don't have to be great to start. You just have to start. The greatness will come, right? Don't be afraid as an entrepreneur to ask, ask for help, seek out additional resources. And so for that reason, we've got a, a free profile audit we're happy to do for anybody on LinkedIn. We'll get you that link so you can share it with your viewers and listeners, because I certainly believe in paying it forward and offer gratitude out to the universe and, and good things will happen. So we're happy to help any and all folks that who might be in your audience tune up their LinkedIn profile so that they can be ready for prime time. Love it. Thanks for your time today, Charles. Appreciate Thanks, it. Charles. I'm Rich, thank you. Stay tuned as John and Rich unpack today's conversation. John, I want us to start where Charles ended. Let's look at that last thing that he said. You don't have to be great to start. You just have to start and the greatness will come. Is that not a line that speaks to every entrepreneur and intrapreneur? And so many times our conversations have led to looking at the nature of an entrepreneur being ready, fire, aim. Just get started. Just put a shot up there at the target and then adjust the next shot to be able to be on point. And that's Charles's recommendation when it comes to optimizing a LinkedIn profile. Yeah, I love that you've gone there. Four years ago, when we talked about starting this podcast, there was a lot of conversation you and I had offline about, okay, do we ready, fire, aim, or do we ready? And listen, I, I think it doesn't matter what you're talking about. People don't realize that every step you take compounds over time. Your learning compounds, your experience compounds, just everything grows. And not spending time working on your LinkedIn profile because it's so far away from other people's profiles, or you only have 100 people in your network and you're going to be able to have 10,000 people and you're like, oh, I'm never going to get to 10,000. You're never going to get anywhere if you don't start. But it applies to everything, in my opinion, is that experience is built over time. And I mentioned this to you the other day. I had a coffee with one of our guests that we had in episode number six of the Entrepreneurs United podcast. And I went back to listen to the episode, right? So I'm listening to the episode and I'm like, oh my goodness, like we didn't have microphones, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was, but we had started, we just got it started. And yes, you have to invest some time to grow over time. You know, if you take a, a long period of time, we're in no rush. So have patient ambition, take your time and just take that step, one step, second step, third step in anything you're doing, whether it be starting up a business, starting up a new venture, a new learning, whatever it may be. Absolutely. And interestingly, some of that patient ambition should be in the building with Maverick as one of his companies and the patient ambition to ultimately want to sell. I, I think I told you a couple of years ago, I read a book built to sell. I forget what guest recommended it to us, but he spoke about that book. He was not the author. That was all about automation and delegation to get to the point where the owner was less necessary in the business to open up the number of buyers who yeah. may be interested in it. So what Charles is talking about with Maverick is beyond just the operational automate and delegate many of the responsibilities which the owner does, but it's get the paperwork in order. Yeah. And act like you're a public company with how you're getting that paperwork and the financials in order. Yeah. And as you grow your business, Rich, what ends up happening is, oh, where's that file again? Oh, we registered in New Mexico. Where's the registration certificate again? And then every year you got to renew. Where's that annual renew to show we have good standing in New Mexico? And then you have your taxes and all your tax filings. And so what we tried to do over the years is we tried to create a library. We tried to create like a spreadsheet of all of our documents with links to go find them. But every year or so, we go back and look at it and go, oh my gosh, it's missing so much stuff. It's out of date. And so how do you keep your documentation, your files in order is I think what Maverick can provide companies. But also, as I mentioned before, this was really costly for me. We actually decided, you know what? Our business is hot right now. The market is hot. Valuations in our industry are hot. Let's sell our business. And we went through a process of selling our business. And as we were going through it, we were then trying to collect all these papers and trying to put everything together and realize we just weren't ready to sell. And it delayed the process. And there's a saying that goes along when, when you're looking to do a deal, 
is that time kills all deals. If you don't have your crap together, when you go do a transaction, it will kill the transaction itself because time just kills everything. So you got to have your stuff together. That's what Maverick does. And I think the same thing applies to when we're talking about LinkedIn or, or your profile, who you are. And even if you aren't big into social media, as an example, a lot of people aren't into uh, a lot of these social media. They don't have a, a Facebook or they don't have all these different profiles. But if you just pick one and say, look, this is my resume, this is my portfolio, here's who I am. If I'm going to be here, I might as well have the right picture and not have some bad picture like we were just talking about with Charles. Focus on being the best in whatever you do. You don't have to do it all. You don't have to be on TikTok and on all the platforms. Pick one and be the best at it. And if you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, LinkedIn is the one to be at. It's the one to create a lot of relationships. And I'll give you this one thing, Rich. The power of LinkedIn that I think is so underutilized is the power of connections. And what I mean by that is on LinkedIn, if I go seek up somebody at a company, chances are I know somebody who knows that person. And what people don't do is say, hey, Rich, I see you're connected to Jim at XYZ Corporation. You and I have a relationship. Would you mind introducing me to Jim? How many times have you seen that on LinkedIn? But every time I've done it, that warm introduction relationship through the connection has worked versus a cold email coming out of nowhere. I yes. haven't seen that often where people had connected with me and said, hey, Sons, can you make an introduction? I got to tell you a story. I don't know if I've told you this or not. It was probably six or seven years ago that a guy by the name of Jim McBrayer connected with me on LinkedIn. Had no idea who he was. I don't accept connections from people who I don't know. It's just something that I prefer to build my network with people who I know. I didn't know him, but I saw there were several people in my network who did know him. It was interesting. He was doing a sales class, sales material type stuff. I reached out to my network and I said, hey, what do you know about Jim McBrayer? I'll be darned if 10 out of 10 came back and they said, I don't know. I just connected with him. He just, <laughs> I don't know the guy. So I was like, this is interesting. So he seems to be targeting people who do something similar to what I do. I'm going to have a conversation with the guy. I'm going to reach out to him. Long story medium at this point is I connected with Jim McBrayer. I found out he had something called a program on persuasion. We ended up working out a deal where it was $1,000 for somebody to attend a couple of day class on the program on persuasion. And 100 people from our franchise body at ServaPro went through it. He got $100,000 what revenue from ServaPro just because he did a LinkedIn connection and it was a blind connection. So it's interesting when you wow. some of the advice that we get on LinkedIn, John, is do you remember a couple of years ago, we had a guest on named Daniel Afton who gave us some LinkedIn advice also. And it was also interesting the route you went down on what are some myths and misconceptions? Because I looked at our note or my notes from that conversation. We did the same thing. We said, what are some myths and misconceptions? Yeah. I'll tell you what, Charles said one of the exact same ones. Which is when you're looking to target people, not to just connect with anybody, look to target people. So the myth is connect with anybody and everybody. And the reality is target people by title and target people by geography, which is what Charles just said. Think about what Jim McBrayer did. He targeted people in a certain industry. He targeted some titles. He just reached out and connected with them. He didn't know them and it turned into a hundred thousand dollars for him so it's actually in the midst of telling me of this story it's making me rethink some of how i treat my linkedin network that maybe i don't need to personally know everybody maybe i need to connect with people who have the titles and the geography with people who i want to get to know yeah no doubt and certainly as you're saying that it just goes to show what Charles and his companies are doing is so important because a lot of people just don't have the time to understand the efficiencies you can gain and the opportunities you can gain, the return on investment you can gain by having companies like the ones Charles has help you be efficient in this tool. So if you're not being efficient in this tool called LinkedIn and other people are making $100,000 by connecting with one person, there's probably an opportunity to explore there and you should probably look into it.